In this set of exercises, we are going to explore the root locus of more complex systems, including those having complex poles and zeros. Let's just start with exercise 60. In this exercise, we have a plant that has complex conjugate poles and a controller k over s. We are looking for the root locus as k varies from 0 to infinity. The first step is to identify the closed loop transfer function and the characteristic equation. And remember, the characteristic equation needs to be written as 1 plus k times a function g of s equals to 0. The characteristic equation of this system is simply 1 plus k times 1 over s times s squared plus 6s plus 25 equals to 0. And here we have the root locus equation expressed in the standard form. We can now identify the poles and zeros that will be used in the root locus. There are no zeros in this expression, and the poles of g of s are s equals to 0, and s squared plus 6s plus 25 equals to 0 gives the other three poles. The poles are the values of s that satisfy this equality, and that is negative 3 plus minus 4j. We have one pole that's 0, and two complex conjugate poles. The real part is negative 3, and the complex part is negative 4j and positive 4j. Now, knowing that the number of poles is 3 and the number of zeros is 0, n minus m equals to 3, and they have an excess of 3 poles. These poles will go to infinity following asymptotes. The angle of those 3 asymptotes can be calculated following this expression, as we did in lecture 11. n minus m equals to 3, and q is 1, 2, and 3. Theta 1, that is the angle of the first asymptote, can be calculated by setting q to 1, and that gives 60 degrees. Theta 2 is found with q equals to 2, and that gives 180 degrees. And theta 3 is found with q equals to 3, and there's 300 degrees, or negative 60 degrees. We can also locate the centroid of those asymptotes. That is given by the sum of poles minus the sum of zeros divided by n minus m. And we call that alpha. Sum of poles, here we have negative 3 plus 4j, negative 3 minus 4j, and plus 0, minus 0, the sum of the zeros, divided by 3. Alpha is negative 2. Now notice that when you have complex conjugate poles, the imaginary par parts will always cancel out. So you can simply consider the real part of the complex poles. The centroid of the asymptotes is at negative 2. One of the asymptotes goes up at an angle of 60 degrees. The other one goes down at an angle of 60 degrees. And the third one has an angle of 180 degrees with respect to the real axis. Now let's calculate the points where the root locus crosses the imaginary axis. To do that, we need to find the characteristic equation of the system and solve for points of that characteristic equation. Specifically, we are interested in solutions of that characteristic equation when the imaginary part is non-zero and the real part is zero. Those are the points where the root locus crosses the imaginary axis. The characteristic equation is written in this form which can also be written as s times s squared plus 6s plus 25 plus k equals to 0, and expanding this gives s to the power of 3 plus 6s squared plus 25s plus k equals to 0. Now remember that any point on the root locus must satisfy this equation. In fact, the root locus is the collection of all points that satisfy this equation when k tends to infinity. And to populate this curve, we can simply replace s with j omega. By doing that, we have j omega plus 6 times j omega squared plus 25 j omega plus k equals to 0. j to the power of 3 is j times j times j, or j squared times j. j squared is square root of minus 1 squared times j, so this is simply negative j. j omega to the power of 3 is thus negative j times omega to the power of 3 minus 6 omega squared plus 25 j omega plus k equals to 0. 
Now we see here that we have a complex function that is a function of omega and k. Let's now isolate the real and imaginary part of this function. The real parts are those that do not depend on j. We have the negative 6 omega squared plus k, and we have an imaginary part. The imaginary part depends on j. j omega times 25 minus omega to the power of 2, which corresponds to the first term of the previous expression, j omega to the power of 3. And this is equal to 0. So here we have the imaginary part, and here we have the real part. We are looking for the point in the root locus that cross the imaginary axis. Now remember that this expression that we found here gives all points in the root locus. We are now looking for points that are satisfied this equation that are across the imaginary axis. When these points lie on the imaginary axis, the real part of that expression needs to be zero. By setting the real part to zero, we can find the values of omega and k that will bring the poles there. If the real part is zero, our original expression now simplifies to 0 plus j omega times 25 minus omega to the power of 2 equals to 0. And the solutions to this expression are simply omega equals to 0 and 25 minus omega squared equals to 0, which gives omega equals to plus minus 5j. These are the points on the imaginary axis where the root locus passes through. There is an additional information that we can take from this. If you know now that when omega the frequency is plus minus 5j, we cross the imaginary axis. If you are able to find the value of k when you cross the imaginary axis, we are basically determining the maximum value of k before the system becomes unstable. How do we find k? We know that when omega equals to plus minus 5j, the real part is 0, which means that a negative 6 omega squared plus k is 0, when omega is plus minus 5j. Now replacing it here, negative 6 plus minus 5j squared plus k equals to 0. Solving for k, we get k equals to plus 150. This is the maximum gain before instability. That's the value of k that will bring the poles to the imaginary axis. Instead of using this analysis, we could have employed the routh hurwitz stability criterion to find the maximum gain before instability using the same characteristic equation. And this would give the exact same result. This method is a bit more complicated, but the advantage is that we know what the value of omega is. We know the point where the root locus crosses the imaginary axis. Now let's look for breakaway or breaking points. Those are the points where the root locus goes from real to imaginary or imaginary from real. These points either leave the real axis or become real when they are complex conjugates. The characteristic equation is 1 plus k times g of s equals to 0. And to find the breakaway or breaking points, we set k to p of s, a function of s. So here we have 1 plus p of s times g of s equals to 0. P of s equals to 1, negative 1, divided by g of s, which means that p of s is the inverse of g of s times negative 1, that is negative s times s squared plus 6s plus 25. The breakaway or breaking points corresponds to the maximum value of p of s. To find the maximum value of p of s, we can take the partial derivative with respect to s and set that to 0. The partial derivative here is s to the power of 3 becomes 3s squared, 6s squared becomes 12s, and 25 times s is simply 25. And now we take this expression and set it to 0. The solutions to this expression corresponds to the maximum value of p, and those are the breakaway and breaking points. Now remember that for a point to be a breakaway or breaking point, they must be real numbers. If they are not real numbers, then this particular root locus has no breakaway or breaking point, which means that the complex conjugate poles will never cross the real axis. The solutions to negative 3s squared negative 12s negative 25 equals to 0 are s equals to negative 2 plus minus 2.08j. This is a complex conjugate number, and because of that, there are no breakaway or breaking points. This again means that these two complex conjugate poles will never cross the real axis. The last piece of information that we can 
calculate to help us draw the root locus is the angle of departure from the complex poles. Now remember that for a point to be part of the root locus, that point must satisfy both requirements for angle and magnitude. The sum of all angles must always be 180 degrees. And that's how we calculated the expression for the departure angle. Sum of all zeros, sum of the angle of all zeros minus the sum of angle of all poles, minus 180, minus L, which is a constant of times 360. And this condition must always be satisfied. Now the way you're going to approach this is to create a reference point. Let's take this reference point here. And this reference point is going to be very close to P1. This is P2. This is P3. If you now take all the poles and we assume that this reference point here, let's call that R, point R is part of the root locus, then if you take all angles with respect to R and all other poles and zeros and add everything up, that must be 180 degrees. Otherwise, R is not part of the root locus. Now let's define the angles between R and all other poles and zeros. So one of them is here, another one is here, and another one is this one. The sum of all these three angles must be 180 degrees. Now, assuming that R and P1 are very close together, then the angle between P2 and the reference point is 90 degrees. Again, because R and P1 are very close. If R and P1 are very close, we can also calculate that angle. And let's call this angle theta 1. And let's call this angle here theta 2. Let's just start by calculating theta 2. Theta 2 is simply the inverse tangent of imaginary part 4 divided by the real part 3. And theta 1 is simply 180 minus theta 2. So theta 1 is 180 minus the inverse tangent of 4 over 3. Theta 1 is 127 degrees. What about the missing angle here? That missing angle is the angle of departure of the complex pole P1. That's what we are trying to calculate. The result of this expression here now, if we replace all angles, with the exception of the angle between P1 and R, is the angle of departure of P1. And again, this comes from the fact that for a point to belong to a root locus, the sum of all angles between poles and zeros must be always 180 degrees. So this is basically our Q phi. Q phi equals to the sum of angles of all zeros, that is zero, there are no zeros in this root locus, minus the sum of all known poles with respect to reference R, that is 90 degrees, plus 127 degrees, minus 180, this comes from the theorem, and minus L times 360. This L times 360 is just a convenience. It's just a way to get entire numbers that are never exceeding 360 degrees. So we can set L to anything, any integer, such as 0, 1, negative 1, 2, or negative 2. For convenience, in this case, I'm going to set L to negative 1. So this is plus 360, which means that the departure angle here is, is negative 37 degrees. If the departure angle of P1 is now known to be negative 37 degrees, the departure angle of P2 needs to be positive 37 degrees because they are always symmetric with respect to the real axis. Now with all this information, we can finally draw the root locus. Here we have the three asymptotes with the angles that we calculated. Where is the root locus? Now the question is a bit different because the root locus as we saw in lecture 11, always exists to the left of another number of poles and zeros. Now we have to expand that rule to account for complex conjugate poles. In fact, to neglect them. We can write the same rule as the root locus is always to the left of another number of real poles and zeros. Complex conjugate poles or zeros will not count. In this case, the portion of the root locus now that falls in that category is this entire part of the negative axis. If the root locus exists there, then the only solution is for this pole at zero to go to negative infinity and use the 180 degree asymptote. We determined that we have two other asymptotes, one on a positive and one on a negative 60 degrees. 
we also determine that there are no breakaway or breaking points. So P1 and P2 will have to go to those asymptotes without touching the real axis. Furthermore, we calculated that P1 and P2 depart at a 37 degree angle. So P1 goes down by 37 degrees when it starts to move, and P1 goes up by 37 degrees when it starts to move. Something else that we calculated is that the poles will cross the imaginary axis at 5j and negative 5j. So now the only solution is that P1 goes like that, and P2 goes in the same way towards the asymptote and then towards the negative imaginary axis. This point here being 5j and this point here being negative 5j. We know that that happens when k is equal to 150. And this is the completed root locus for this example. What else can we say about this system? We know that when k is greater than 0 and is smaller than 150 degrees, this system is underdamped because you have complex conjugate poles that will be present along this part of the root locus. When k equals to 150, the system is marginally or critically stable. And when k is greater than 150, the system is unstable. To verify these results in MATLAB, create a function g of s, as we defined before, and simply type r locus of g.